we are going to talk about um, ways to stop spinning our wheels, you know, that kind of feeling of treading water um, or the feeling of uh, putting a lot of energy into things that aren't where we want to be putting our energy or our life force. And um, this is a the concept that I'm, I'm working on a, a fourth book right now. I have a book coming out about uh, psychological barriers to movement coming out this uh, spring. But I'm working on a, a project right now about wise effort from a Buddhist perspective, but also from a psychological perspective. This is my kitchen window here in Santa Barbara. And um, when because we live in this area that we can keep our our doors open a lot, sometimes we'll get a bird that flies in our kitchen. We get lots of lizards, birds, snakes, all sorts of critters that come in our kitchen. And uh, when a bird gets in a kitchen and it sees something like this, what do you think it does? You know, it does what birds do, right? It flies up and out and boom, hits its head against the wall. And then the bird will kind of get on the floor and it'll see that window again and it'll fly up and out and boom, hit its head against the wall right? Uh, the window, not the wall, the window. And uh, when, when a bird does this, it's so, it's so painful to watch, right? We feel compassion for that bird. Like, oh, you're just trying to get out of your stuck spot. And this is what you do. You're a bird that flies and flies up and out in this way. But sometimes we don't have that same compassion for ourselves when we're in a stuck spot. We don't see ourselves in that same way that we're just doing what humans do, which is trying to avoid pain, trying to go for things that we want in life, um, trying to feel like our life has some kind of purpose to it. And, and we have our own version of flying at windows. Every single person that's here, including me, has a way in which we fly at windows and hit our head. Maybe those windows are um, addictions that you struggle with. Maybe those windows are things that um, you do when you feel in a relationship, kind of in a stuck spot, you know, you, you, your window becomes like, I'm going to work harder at trying to change that person and uh, dig myself into my resentment or whatever it is. And when you, when you are in my position with, the, with a bird in the kitchen, what do you do to help it get out? And how does a bird get out? Uh, the, the first thing we have to do is, is kind of try some other things. Maybe turn yourself around, get a different perspective that there's not just one way to do this. There's lots of ways to do it, right? And that takes a lot of courage. Um, it takes courage to turn ourselves around and try something new. We also, when we're hitting our head against a window, we don't tell the bird things like, don't be such a bird, you're flying too much, right? And we tell that to ourselves, like, don't be so much of who you are. But maybe it's that the bird needs to shift its energy and yeah, fly, but fly towards something different, fly in a way that's more open. And eventually the bird with it, maybe a help of a broom will find its way to the open door that if got in the kitchen in the first place. So in psychology, there's a, there's a long time term time interest in, um, you know, human needs. We think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Most people have heard of that. We think about self-determination theory, which is another theory around what it is that human need. We need, we need autonomy. We need relatedness. Um, we need the uh, ability to like grow and change. But more recently, Stephen Hayes, who's the founder of acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a type of therapy I practice called ACT, has looked more deeply into evolution theory, theory and built on these ideas of humans core yearnings. And it's such a great word. Like, what is that bird really yearning for? What is it that you really are yearning for when you find yourself hitting your head against a window? Right? And they um, have identified these six core human yearnings that we all have, right? We have a yearning to belong, to be included. We have a yearning to make sense of things to understand our world. We have a yearning to feel things, 
to have deep feelings. We, we yearn for that. I have, I have a teenager. I'm sure that's like part of his like experience right now. It's like, I yearn to just feel deeply. But we all, we all humans yearn to feel. We yearn to be present in the here and now, to be oriented in our space, to like land here. And we yearn to feel like, like we matter. Um, that, that what we do, you know, isn't just useless, but that we have a purpose. Um, and then we also yearn to grow. We want to learn things. We want to, you know, that's why we come back to these things like Rick's group is, gosh, I'm like learning something. I'm growing. It's, it's really satisfying. And so when we're flying at a window, sometimes we're flying at that window because of these yearnings, but the way that we're going about it is misdirected. Maybe it's like we yearn to connect with others, but that desire to connect or to belong is so painful. So then we don't go, you know, we don't go to that event or we don't start that conversation with somebody or we don't share how we're really, you know, we really feel. I, as a therapist, I always, um, I, I have to have sort of the 80% rule, which is I assume that even if you're a client that I've been seeing for like five years, you're still only giving me 80%. There's 20% in there that you're not saying. And I'll, I'll say that in a session. I'll be like, what's the 20% that you didn't say, right? But in a lot of our relationships, it's the 60% rule. There's 40% that we're not saying because of this yearning to connect that's gone astray. Same thing with our yearning to make sense of things. It can lead us to get super heady and analyze everything, right? And not really make sense in a wisdom way. So all these yearnings can get misdirected. If you want to learn more about yearning, if this is like interesting to you, it's super interesting to me. Um, Steve Hayes has a book called The Liberated Mind, where he talks about all of these yearnings. And when they're met, when, um, not that these yearnings ever get like go away, but like when you, when you feel like you belong, when you're feeling deeply, this is what being human is like. You feel alive. You know what matters to you. You're open to your feelings. You have a flexible mind. You feel supported and connected. You enjoy the good that's here. You feel spacious, expansive, and free. You're naturally using your energy in ways that are helpful, not only to benefit you, but to benefit others. So that's the bird that's turned itself around. It is like, boom, flying. And we've all had maybe moments of this, this experience of vitality. And for me, that experience of vitality is when we are engaging in wise effort. We're using our life force, our energy, wisely. So last week I talked a lot about what throws us off track from that. And I, I opened with this myth of normalcy that there's a one in 16 million chance that you are normal, you know, and that actually the, there's a whole dark side to the field of psychology that has separated normal from abnormal, put people in boxes, diagnoses. If you have five of nine symptoms, you're this. But the reality is actually, if you start to look at the research in psychology, most people do not fit even in the, those boxes. If you're diagnosing people, most people fit in something called not otherwise specified. I used to run research projects um, for uh, eating disorders. I was um, uh, you know, doing these uh, interviews where you interview people whether or not they make it into the research study. Most people don't make it into the research study because they don't fit the box of abnormality even, right? So this is a myth of, of normalcy that each and every single one of us, like these sunflowers that are right outside Plum Village, is unique. And yet, each and every one of us is the same. That that can, that can co-occur. We can both be human and have these core human yearnings, and then we can have our own unique expression of that. And I believe that wise effort, which is you know, one of the steps on the Eightfold Path, but if you expand that to the, the steps of what it means to live with vitality, that wise effort is acknowledging your humanness, but also honoring your uniqueness. And I, and I see that uniqueness as everybody's inner genius. You may recoil from the word genius, but if you look at the root of the word genius, it actually traces back to ancient Roman religion where geniuses were seen as spirits that traveled to villages and protected clans and families. And then genius is then the word um, then translated to a protector within yourself. And then eventually a genius became, you know, an Einstein, a person with, you know, these 
extreme intellectual abilities. But when you actually look at the word genius, it's this genius energy. We see it in plants, we see it in animals, we see it in each other. I see it every single time I'm sitting across the way from a client, that there's something about them that has the capacity, if they were to turn their energy around, that could heal them. That my job is not to heal anyone, but rather to create a context in which their own inner genius can start to show up, their own wisdom, so that they can use that energy wisely. I had a, um, I do a podcast called The Wise Effort Show, and I interviewed this woman who is part, she was the founder of Biomimicry 3.8. And Biomimicry is looking at nature's genius to help solve human problems. So they'll do things like um, like the bullet train in Japan. They, they looked at when a bullet train goes from, it's going at such a speed that when it goes from outside into a tunnel and then outside again, that, chain, that change in air pressure would create a sonic boom. So people don't really want these trains going through their neighborhoods doing a sonic boom every single time they came through. And so they looked at, key, one of the engineers on the program was a real uh, fisherman. And he looked at the way that a um, kingfisher beak enters from air into water without that same kind of pressure change, right? And then they designed this bullet train based on the, the beak of a kingfisher bird. That's genius. I'm a bee guardian. These little bees that are doing their thing, the, the, you know, the little guard bees that when I get close to my hive come around my head as a warning to tell me it's time to leave and then follow me up my stairs until I'm a nice enough distance then they go back home. That's their genius, right? They're protectors. And then there's other bees within our colony that have other forms of genius. Every single species and human has a genius. And so part of directing our energy, our life force, is to identify what your gifts are, your talents, what makes you feel alive, what makes you an original, and then channeling that towards your human yearnings. And it may be things like, there's so many, there's, we're all different. It may be things that you're really great at helping people. You're really emotionally sensitive. You're a problem solver. You you have a lot of stamina. You have a bright light to you. Like you're the person that when, you know, everyone else is down, you're kind of like in the room seeing, you know, the optimist, right? There's so many different qualities and unique, you know, sort of like if you were painting a painting, different colors that come together in each unique human being. But the problem is like a bird that's flying at the window, this, this energy can be a blessing and a challenge. It isn't always easy to manage. And we need to challenge it, to channel it in a way that is wise. Because last week I talked about the things that, that get in the way, that misdirect our energy. We run away from things that we're afraid of. We put it in the wrong places. We get in a story about who we are and who we are not, what we're capable of and what we can't do. We get closed in our mindsets. And all of those things keep us hitting that window, right? Because in order for the bird to turn around and fly out, it needs to be willing to enter the uncertainty of what it would go mean to go in another direction. It needs to let go of a story that this is the only way to do it, right? And it needs to put that energy in a different way. So when we look at wise effort from the traditional Buddhist perspective, it, it involves sort of these four things of, of if, you're, if you can, you know, don't get in the kitchen in the first place. If you can, that'd be great, right? Prevent unwholesome states from arising. And then noticing when you're in them, abandoning them, letting go of them. I love this word abandonment because it's such a, you know, a different flavor, right? To let go. And then, whoops, sorry for the typo, cultivating wholesome states that haven't yet arisen. Like, can, can you use your energy to, to drum something up that is workable for you? And then once you get it going, keep doing it, right? I interviewed um, Gil Fransdahl a while back on the Wise Effort show, and he talked about this as, um, like, if you're doing something that's helpful, keep doing it. If you're doing something that's harmful, stop doing it. <laughs> that was his definition of the wise, of wise effort, which I liked. He's got such a practical uh, way of, of, of seeing things. So we, we discover, okay, here I am. I'm in the kitchen. What's my genius energy? I can fly. I'm a good flyer. 
I'm a good helper. I'm a good emotional sensor. I'm, um, you know, for me, as I've been exploring in this project, I, I see it in other people. You know, I start to think about my parents, what's their genius energy? What is it, what is it that they, what comes easily to them or the ways in which they contribute that um, are so unique to them? My friends, what's their genius energy? Even my dog has a genius energy to her. She can open every door in the house, you know, <laughs> with her paw. She can get into things that are, seem impossible for any dog to get into. So what's yours? And then how can you direct that energy towards what matters to you? towards what's worth it to you. And that's when we start to look at things like values. So values are a very um, hot topic right now in the field of psychology. And there's also like a lot of misconceptions about values. And in the type of therapy I practice and act, values sort of have this like these unique qualities to them that aren't morals, that aren't, um, aren't even like adjectives. So like adventure, we wouldn't say adventure is a value. We would say being adventurous is a value. It's something that if I were following you around throughout your day and I saw you in those moments that you feel like you are acting in a way that you feel proud of, that demonstrate how you want to show up in the world, what would I see you doing? You know, those, those verbs and those actions that you take. And oftentimes when we are engaging with our values, we feel meaning, but we don't always feel comfort and pleasure. I was just working with a client this past week in his 70s who was in a conflictual relationship with his sister for decades, and she's dying. She's in hospice. And so much of our uh, sessions were about the visits, going to visit her. Not comfortable, not pleasurable, did not enjoy the situation. And for him, it was really aligned with his values to go. When we engage our values, it makes us more vulnerable. It actually doesn't protect us from pain. In, in a similar way, when they've looked at meditators, their senses are more open. They may even experience more pain, but they don't experience the anticipation of pain in the same way, right? So when we live our values, we may be more... Uh, in that domain of the, um, the core, the human yearnings of feeling deeply. You're gonna feel things. You're gonna be more human. And our values are qualities that we bring to the important domains of our life. So I'll often work with clients and the first kind of question I ask is like about values. I have a little thing in my intake, what's your values? And a lot of people say things, I value family, I value health, I value my work and I want to dig a little bit deeper. So what does that mean? Like, what are the qualities you want to bring to your health? What does that look like for you? Do you want to be more present with awareness of your body? Or do you want to bring more compassion to your health? Do you want to bring, bring more fun and play into your health? Do you want to um, bring a little bit more honesty into your relationship? You know, do you want to go from the 60% to the 80%, right? These are the qualities that you bring to the domains of your life. And they're chosen, they're personal, they're not prescribed, they're not given to you. They change over time, over the arc of your life, they change with you. And that's what's so fun about values is that you are the author of them. So questions that, you know, I'll sit in with a session and you can ask yourself of what does it mean to you to have a meaningful and fulfilling life? What type of person do you want to be in these different areas? What's important to you? What might be missing in your life? And seeing that just like that bird, every single time that bird is flying at the window again is a choice point. So every moment is a choice point. We can, in the moment, experience something that's uncomfortable. You know, I was re doing the meditation. I open my eyes. I look at the chat. Oh, I think I offended somebody. It's uncomfortable. And in that moment, we can remember, what, what are my values here? What am I here for? Why, why am I here? And how do I want to show up with that pain? Do I want to move towards it and offer something that is true and maybe for me or an apology or a, 
a way of shifting the way that I am languaging something to offer compassion, or am I going to hide away? I'm going to go away from my values. And much like a guitar, you can feel it. Like you can feel it when you make that choice to be more in tune with your values. And only you know what that is for you because they're chosen and personal to you. So that's the bird, right? We, we turn our direction around the second step towards what it is that is important to us and how we want to show up independent of what's happening to us because our response is what matters. Uh, I interviewed a Stephen Batchelor oh, uh, this summer. I was in Bordeaux. We were going to Plum Village and we had this great interview about the four tasks which he made the argument, uh, he's such a, he's a Buddhist scholar, and he made this argument that the four tasks actually um, are kind of even what's more important than the four noble truths, <laughs> according to Stephen Batchelor. And, and these, you can listen to the interview to hear the four tasks, but the four tasks have a lot to do with noticing these choice points, noticing these spaces where you have the choice to turn towards right effort, turn towards right action, right livelihood. So we're caught in the kitchen. We're using our lot of energy in the direction we want to use it in. We pause. We're like, okay, what is, what is my energy? What is my, my genius? What is my offering? What do I have to offer here? Um, what are my yearnings? And then we direct ourselves towards our values. And then this next step is sort of an interesting one because as soon as you start directing yourself towards your values, you're going to feel stuff. And much of our suffering comes from our unwillingness to feel. A lot of our suffering comes from our unwillingness to feel. And all the stuff that we do to cover up our feelings, to get rid of our feelings, to make our feelings go away. And in uh, psychology, this call it, they call this experiential avoidance. Because it is quite healthy to avoid things that are harmful to you. Please, if it is harmful to you physically, don't you know, don't go towards it. Like, don't put your hand on the hot stove if it's going to burn you. But much of what we are avoiding isn't actually harmful to us per se, but their avoidance strategies are. Have you ever heard of someone say, I can't do that. I will die of embarrassment. Have you heard of someone say that before? I'm just going to die. I will die of embarrassment if I get up and make a speech at my brother's wedding. I will die of embarrassment if I get on the dance floor. I will die of embarrassment if I wear that thing on Halloween, right? We say this thing, that we will die. Have you ever met anyone that's died of embarrassment? Ever. You know what happens when you get embarrassed? It happens to me quite a lot. So you get embarrassed. Your cheeks get a little bit red. Your heart starts to beat quickly. Your mind starts to say things like, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. And then it gets louder and louder and your heart beats faster and faster. And then it eventually goes away and you don't die. I haven't ever met anyone that's died of a feeling. I've met people, experienced in my practice, people that have been very much harmed by what they have done to respond to feelings that were very, that felt unbearable. So our capacity to open up to feelings is, is necessary, but there's a, there's a practice to this. And it's not just go dive your, put your face in that mud pile. <laughs> you know, we have to, learn how to be with our uncomfortable feelings. So here we are, the bird in the kitchen. I want to choose something different here, and it's scary. And whatever your bird in your kitchen is, you can think about what that is, you know, like maybe you're coming home from work and you want to start going for a walk in the evenings. And that feels kind of scary because that's not your routine. You're doing something different than what you usually do. Something as simple as that, you know, just going for a walk can be scary, it's uncomfortable. So the first thing that we, that we practice with being open to uncomfortable feelings is centering ourselves. Many of the meditation practices that in, in we begin our meditation practice with the centering, we slow down, we, we take three breaths, maybe we pay attention to our senses. There's lots of contemplative practice ways to center ourselves. When I uh, teach yoga, I have people imagine they're growing roots through the soles of their feet all the way to the center of the earth and wrapping it around the core 
of the earth, you know, so that you feel centered, you feel rooted. But there's also ways we center ourselves that aren't, you know, just sort of like not contemplative practice, but makes sense. You know, you put on your playlist that is your centering playlist, or you go and pet your dog, you, pull, you know, have your cat on your lap. And these are practices that are acting on your nervous system, on your parasympathetic nervous system, our vagus nerve that takes in sound and helps us soothe our system. So we begin with learning for ourselves in our own unique way what centers us. And uh, the field of psychology is really interested in this now, this, this um, individualized, individualized medicine, individualized mental health. Because there are people who, when they breathe, they have a panic attack when they focus on their breath. And for those folks, when they're in my office, I don't tell them to take three breaths. I tell them to look out the window at something really far away, something I learned from Rick Hansen in Neurodharma many years back when I read it, is, you know, you look at something really far away and it makes you feel more interconnected, that allocentric parts of your brain get activated, right? So there's lots of ways to center. And then after we center ourselves, we have that rootedness in something, in the spin, it's everything still spinning with our uncomfortable feeling, the next step has to do with going to the feeling, welcoming it. Pama Chodron teaches a lot about this, a lot of Buddhist practices, like putting out the welcome mat for the, for the feeling, going to it, getting out of our story into our body. Where is it? Maybe does it have a color or a weight or a shape? Is it moving? You can do this as I say this, right? So you center yourself, you go to the feeling in your body and you make some space for it. Maybe if you want, you can give it a name. There's plenty of research on that, that just naming our emotions helps regulate them. But you don't have to, you know, these Vipassana practices that are like noting just unpleasant or pleasant, just the quality would be fine. Or if you want to say feeling, you could say that. Or if you want to say anger or sadness or a combination, that's fine too. And then we take care of our feeling. Oh, I'm here for you. Brother Fapu at Plum Village talks a lot about caring for our feelings. Hello, loneliness. I'm here for you. Hello, loneliness. I see you. In the same way that a parent and a child, you know, may hold a child that has like a injury on their knee or something. They can't really do much to get rid of that pain in their knee, but they can do a lot by just saying, oh, show me where it hurts. I'm here for you. So we can do that for ourselves. And then eventually we may get to the place where we start to see there's something in this feeling that is pointing me to what matters. In that mud, there's a heart. So what is that? What's important to me here, feeling? Like, what are you trying to point me to? I'm feeling stuck. Okay. What is it that you care about that's making this hurt so much? You generally will not have strong feelings unless you care a lot about something. If you don't care about it, it doesn't bother you. <laughs> this is like a rule of thumb. So if we can get the bother, then we can go to the feeling. So we learn to be with uncomfortable feelings. And then we also notice that um, a lot of what's keeping us flying at that window is our story. <laughs> That's the only way out. You know, we get, we get trapped in our in our thinking and um, we believe that our mind what our mind says is true we just have these rules i have to go left here i've always gone left here might as well go left here right we don't we don't question our minds and developing a meditation practice is a practice of observing the mind it's not necessarily getting into battle with the mind wrangling the mind uh you know having a whole lot of conversations with your mind. If you're having a lot of conversations with your mind in meditation, it may be a good time to get into your body, <laughs> you know? But in meditation practice, we're just observing. You know, when we, we practice today, we open to our feelings, but we opened to our minds. Because when we're stuck in our thinking, it is almost as if the thoughts are, are blocking our view they block our view we don't see reality we don't see what's here we just we just see the images so my our, our thoughts can be images our thoughts can be words our thoughts can be sounds and a lot of these words and images and sounds 
didn't even really originate with you, you know, so maybe they were things that were passed on to you as a small child. Maybe they come from an anxiety sensitivity that you were born with in terms of just the way your nervous system is set up, or maybe they have been sold to you, you know, feel bad about yourself. So you buy something, right? So a lot of the thoughts that are going on, these comparison judgments, rules, we need to start to question. And we also need to start to question them because we know from psychological science, from cognitive psychology, a lot of what our mind is doing is also biased. So if you were to look at every single person, I think I did this last time, I can't remember if I did this or not. If you looked at everyone on our screen, although maybe you can't save everyone because I have these slides up, maybe you just have a few people. You could ask yourself like, which one of these people would I want to have a cup of coffee with? Which one of these people would I want to uh, have you know, dog sit for me? Which one of these people would I want to be stuck on an airplane with? And guess what? Every single one of those answers is biased. You haven't had a conversation. You don't know what this person does or cares about or who they are. It's biased. It's biased by what you see, by what the interpretation is, that cognitive bias of, I see you because you wear glasses, you're smart, and I see you because you're wearing a you know, comfy jacket, you're warm, <laughs> you know? But then also racial bias, prejudice, it all comes from up here. So we have to question our minds. We have to get better at questioning our minds. And then there's the built-in cognitive biases, things like negativity bias or the fun fundamental attribution error, which is we see people's disposition as causing their behavior. Oh, you're stuck in that addiction because you're a bad person, as opposed to context that contributes to behavior. So when you go to Plum Village, there's all these beautiful, um, uh, what would I call that? Banners uh, that they created for the 40th anniversary of Plum Village. And they say all sorts of things on them. And you go on all these, um, you know, you, at 11 o'clock, you go on these beautiful, mindful walks. And somewhere along the walk, your mind starts to say a few things about this walk, like when we're going to get there, my kids are too loud, um, I forgot to email that person back, all the things. I'm too hot, I'm too tired, I hate this, I love this, I don't want this to end, all the things. And then you come across this banner, which is just, are you sure? You sure? The interruption of the mind, it's not necessarily to start to find evidence like in a cognitive behavioral therapy way, like what are the pros and cons of, you know, of that thought? It's just the interruption of the thought that you've gotten close up to. And then we can use these, you know, these practices of um, right speech, but we can use right speech with our own minds. So we can say things, this is helpful. This is kind. Is it timely? Is it true? Because some, sometimes thoughts are, you know, quite true and sometimes they're helpful, but it's just a really bad time. It's like two o'clock in the morning. You don't need this thought to be dominating your experience. So we question our own mind and the questioning of the mind is such a beautiful practice because you don't have to have the answer. You really don't need to get into that cognitive looping of figuring things out. It's just the interruption of the fusion. And this is where um, in the type of therapy that I practice in, in acceptance and commitment therapy and sort of these more kind of modern approaches to therapy that we're less interested in that battling of thoughts or is this a dysfunctional or a functional thought? It's just more about noticing the thought. Okay, so bird in the kitchen, Orient. First, what is your genius? What is your genius energy? What do you have? What is unique about you? And then what is just completely human about being stuck? And then we move to finding a direction where we wanna point our energy towards our values. We move to opening to the feelings that show up when we do that. Like, I really need to get better at feeling. Not that I necessarily need to feel better, right? So that's a very, very common thing we'll say in ACT is, how can we get better at feeling? Even if your feelings don't go away. And then we open our minds. Don't believe every thought that crosses our minds. Don't let our thoughts push us around. And we open our sense of self. We open our sense of self. We did this a bit in our practice of meditation tonight where we made contact with this interconnected self because often 
if I were to say, point to yourself, point to yourself. Most people do this or they do this, right? This is me, right? This is me. And um, in having spent time sort of exploring this concept, it's like, oh, really? Like, so what is this made of? This me. It's made, I had some tofu and like this really yummy Japanese um, barbecue sauce. You have to go get the Japanese barbecue sauce. We put on everything in our house. We put on our eggs, we put on our tofu, everything. So I, so this is, this is tofu and Japanese barbecue sauce right here. Okay. What else is this? This is, um, oh gosh, every single cell in my body has my biological parents. But every single cell in my body also has my life experience. You know, that, that maybe for some of us, the pandemic or traumas have changed the epigenetics of our cells, the way in which our genes are expressed. So maybe I'm also that, right? And I'm that. And then we can also say, okay, what is this? And start to see that this has more space in it than it does solid. So this is air, right? Our self is so much more than just us. And we know this when we get to practice, you know, you do, um, you know, breathing meditation outside of a tree and you're breathing in the tree and then you're offering breath to the tree. So maybe I'm a tree. Maybe I'm the, the air that comes from a tree. When we get stuck in ourselves, we miss out on the here and now. We, we ignore context. We ignore how everything is impacting everything. We are shaping our context, our environment, and our environment is shaping us. Um, it's interdependence. It's called interbehaviorism in psychology, interdependence. Um, inter R is how Ty would call it. When we get boxed in by our stories about who we are, we get really inflexible in behavior. I'm not the type of person who I hear a lot in my practice. And we have one bad experience, so we never go there again. We, we define ourselves by our bad experience, right? So I fell when I was skiing, when I was eight years old. I, I just, I don't ski. Mm -mm. I'm not the type of person who skis, <laughs> right? We have these confirmation biases and it interferes with seeing our sameness, you know, it interferes with empathy and disconnects us from a greater whole. Because we make these lists about who I am and who you are and who they are. And you could answer this, like you could say, I am this, I am this, I am this. You can say positive things about yourself. You can say negative things about yourself. Warning, the positive things about yourself are just as dangerous sometimes as the negative things. Because what happens if you see yourself as smart, but then you come across something that is challenging? Do you give up more easily? Yes, the research suggests that. <laughs> You give up more easily. You won't persist because I'm smart. If this is challenging for me, I better not continue because I would have figured it out. Same thing with the they are's. You know, when I work with couples, you hear it like, oh, they are, they are this way. You are this way. You always, you never, you can't. And as soon as we box people, we prevent the possibility for them, you know, exploring other opportunities, moving in a different way. So this is an um, image of the bees in my beehive. I often present this image whenever I do talks because I just think it's the cutest thing on the planet. Them linking their little legs to get to hard to reach spots. It's called festooning. Festooning, and this is how they get to when the, we do biodynamic beekeeping, which means it, it grows naturally into this like a, kind of like a V shape. And they have to link their legs to get down to the bottom of the V and repair the hive. And so you could ask, you know, like, what, what is this bee doing here? This is wise effort. You know, it's effort that's in the service of something bigger than them. It's interconnected. It's open. They're not letting their minds get in the way of doing stuff. And, um, and the bee hive itself is, is one organism with many individual organisms. So it's both that. Both the, both the whole and the individual parts. So I think that's just a beautiful example of wise effort. 
All right. So if you want to learn more, if you want to get uh, connected with me, I have a website that you can get onto my email list and I send out wise effort emails when I try and aim to every other week. And I have a podcast called the wise effort show and um, yeah, lots of different resources, meditations and things like that at drdianahill.com. And I will end it there. Bring us back with a few minutes for us to have some more conversation and questions. I don't know, Madison, if you wanna, um, or who, how we, who, how we work with questions, but I think if there's a host that can help me unmute people, we can go through some of the questions and unmute and I can answer them. Madison, if you could unmute yourself there. I did, thank you. Thank you, great talk, I loved it. Um, I had something come up, I'm trying to face the speaker. Can I face her or? Yeah, um, okay. yeah I see you, I see you, okay. yeah. Um, I had something really scary come up today and I didn't know what to do about it. Mm. I. I ran out of energy. My energy has been slowing down for three or four days. And initially I started blaming the acupuncturist or blaming somebody who gave me another treatment two days earlier and blaming and blaming. And then I sat there in my bed and I said, well, you have an appointment to make. So you're getting out of the bed. But it was a really scary moment of thinking, I'm in this bed forever. Now everything has changed. And I guess I wondered if you could address that because I, I heard that in what you were saying of kind of getting trapped by the thought. I got out of the thought because I had an obligation. Mm. So I got out of the bed. But while I was there, and then I talked with somebody later today who had Epstein Barr or something like that. And I said, oh my God, I had an experience like maybe what you have. And oh, I really appreciated that. And then it was like, no, I didn't appreciate it. I wanted to fly a thousand miles away from it. Mm -hmm. um, I, It's been hard for me to demonstrate acceptance when I come up with, come upon physical limitations, even if they're very short lived. There's yeah. just a moment of no. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel that that's just really normal it's really scary to be in that powerless spot especially when we're in feeling powerless of our own bodies you know it, it's a scary experience and our mind as it does with scary experiences will amplify and extend it yeah. this is never going to end this is going to keep coming back um, and, and with physical stuff it, it, our mind can really do that because it's so it's trying to protect us right your mind is trying to protect you like okay like how, how do i get out of this state but it actually makes you us panic and when we're in that space i often find um that the, the the two foundational practices that are the most helpful is the first practice of just coming back to something that is here and now and grounded for some people when they're experiencing physical um, discomfort, going to the breath can feel like a, it just cannot feel a safe place to go to. If you have a breath practice, you could go there, a mantra, or look at something in the room to focus on anywhere but your mind right now, because <laughs> your mind isn't being super helpful. The second practice that, um, that I would turn to in that moment is just a practice of, of compassion, maybe hand on your body, hand on your heart. This is scary. Sometimes that's just, that's the most compassionate thing to do is just say, this is scary. And sometimes those, those fears are, are real. You know, if you've been through all sorts of things, a disaster, natural disaster, war that's happening right now, this is scary. That is an act of compassion just to name it and to hold yourself in it. And you ride it out. <laughs> you know, the one thing that we know is that everything changes. Sometimes it doesn't change on our timeline. We have pockets of relief and then we go back into pain and then we have pockets of relief, but all we can do is handle the here and now. Yeah. 
I really appreciate that. And also, I think I have a new thought, which is not helpful at all, which is, oh, you're aging. So this is it. Aging just hit. Yeah. Sorry. Now you got aging. There's nothing you can do. And that obviously I did not have that thought 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I'm having it now. And I guess it's the same practice, but it really sneaks up and it gets really creepy. Yeah. Yeah, we, we got to start to know, notice our mind's tactics that sometimes our mind is like the worst motivational support system ever. <laughs> and says like the least helpful things, right? It's, it's trying to help you out. But um, yeah, all of those things that come in when we're struggling that our mind does, like we're trying a new thing, like maybe we're trying a new thing for the first time and our mind comes and criticizes every single, it picks every single little thing. And we're just trying to to do a new thing. We're learning a language or instrument. So yeah, your mind is going to say things like, oh, this is aging. This is, oh, this is, and you start to notice that that is your mind. That is not you. You, you aren't your mind. And you kind of treat it sort of like if you're going in to get a sandwich at a sandwich shop and there's the news on and it's the news channel that you don't like, right? You can pay attention to that news channel or you can let it be in the background and order your sandwich. So that's, that's sort of the practice of just noticing the mind, but not letting the mind run the show.